Welcome in to the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. You know, ever since Discovery Channel and other channels have rolled back paranormal programming, I've heard a little bit of a backlash from you guys about, well, whatever happened to and what's going on with and what is happening with paranormal investigating. Well, we like to keep you involved in what exactly is going on with paranormal investigating and what's new in the field and what's happening with different paranormal teams out there in the field. So today I thought I'd bring in a good friend of ours here on the program. His name is Joshua Chairs, and he's the founder and director of Phantom Detectives LLC. Now, Joshua's been in the field for quite a while, and he's been making some waves out there. He's a paranormal investigator, historian, writer, researcher, musician, and publicist. Uh, Joshua got interested in the supernatural at an early age while watching Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack. His interest in the supernatural peaked in 2002 when he had the opportunity to investigate the General Wayne Inn in Marion Station, Pennsylvania. Joshua was a 2008 graduate in of Westchester University and a future graduate student majoring in business administration. In 2014, Joshua co-founded the Summer Wind Restoration Society along with Wisconsin paranormal investigator Craig Naring. Uh, their goal was to use the original blueprints of Summer Wind Mansion to restore, rebuild, and launch Summer Wind Mansion as a museum. With its haunted history, Summer Wind is known to be the most haunted location in Wisconsin. In August of 2020, Joshua founded Phantom Detectives LLC as a way to help people who were going through paranormal experiences. Using the Paranormal Research Society blueprint, Joshua was hoping to build a team of renowned paranormal investigators and is dedicated to helping people that are going through these experiences. Joshua has investigated such renowned paranormal hotspots as the Sanderson Museum, Selma Mansion, Mill of Anselma, the General Wayne Inn, Fort Mifflin, Penhurst, Smyrna Museum, Gettysburg, Chad's Ford Historical Society, and many other locations. On May 21st of 2021, Joshua's company, Phantom Detectives LLC, acquired the rights to the late Art Bell's former affiliate director news program, Dark Matter News, and we'll have a link to that in the description of this program. Let's bring in right now to Darkness Radio, Joshua Chairs. Joshua, good evening. How are you? Good evening. How are you, Tim? I am absolutely wonderful. How are you today? Doing absolutely well, my friend. Um, I know we, we went over a little bit about how your interest first started, but but let's get into the investigating part of this and, and exactly how the interest in actually getting out into the field first started. I know we all kind of got into this deal in a lot of different ways, and I know you and I share the, the love and interest of, of Art Bell and getting inspired by art as well. Um, maybe we'll start there. Let's start a little bit by getting inspired by art because you knew art personally, correct? Yes, um, I had uh, done Skype calls with him and I had uh, booked work with a few of his staff members, uh, you know, in the past booking their guests, setting up their contacts. I worked with Dr. J for a while, uh, his former producer. And I worked with another uh, a former affiliate director after uh, Leo uh, left uh, Dark Matter Digital Network. I worked with her for a while. Um, so I really got involved in the, you know, working with art in, you know, in, you know, art staff members in the early days and I learned a lot from them. They taught me the importance of going out networking and going out and you know pushing yourself every day to get better and staying humble and kind and you know just going out putting the work in and, and uh, so far we've really been taking off and I'm taking their skills out they taught me and applying them into our paranormal investigations and almost every every case that we do uh, you know, as a team, we always come up with at least three or four pieces of evidence. And I think that's a testament to our work ethic, our dedication, and our desire to get better and grow. What was it about actually wanting to get into the field and get into investigating, though? Why did you want to actually leap into this and go face to face with something supernatural? What was it about that particular part of it that excited you? 
I think the early days, of course, watching Unsolved Mysteries of Robert Stack, I mean, everybody watched that show back in those days. And of course, uh, you know, In Search of by Leonard Nimoy, which was kind of one of the first, you know, Spock from Star Trek did the first like true paranormal television show. So I would say those two things, and it was actually watching the uh, Unsolved Mysteries episode with Robert Stack back in 1987 with about the General Wayne Inn. I think it was season one, episode five about this old coaching inn. It dates back to 1705. And the famous people like George Washington stayed there, Marquis de Lafayette, Edgar Allan Poe, um, as well as, you know, other famous dignitaries. So it was an amazing place. And of course, watching the episode, according to the history of the inn, there were supposedly patrons on the bar that would have like women would have their like, you know, necks tickled. They would also have they would see Hessian soldiers on the steps of this old coaching inn. They would also see, um, you know, as well as, you know, in the basement area, they would see like, you know, mist and, you know, yellow mist and shadows. And they would also see like a car that would start on its own. Um, and when a tenant would go outside and, you know, the car was completely locked. So that, you know, that episode really piqued my interest. And then in the early 1990s, I just started diving into the paranormal. I read every book by Hans Holzer. I mean, he was really was the pioneer of this all. And Dr. Holzer's books, uh, along with his legendary uh, investigations with his transmedium, Ethel Myers and Sybil Leake. And I've actually had the opportunity to talk to Julian Leake, Ethel, uh, um, Sybil's son. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he continues her, her passion. He's a photographer and he also, you know, still updates some of her books. Like he'll actually like do a preface and, you know, opening to it. So reading about Hans Hans Holzer, I mean, he was absolutely amazing for his time. He's Alexandria Holzer's uh, father. And then, of course, um, you know, in 1993, I remember listening to Art Bell, you know, listening to interview to interview Al Bielik about the Philadelphia experiment and Preston Nichols about the Montauk project. So listening to Art in the 90s combined with reading books by Dr. Holzer, I got every book I could on, like, UFOs, uh, reading with Whitley Strieber and, you know, Communion and Hunger and all his books, uh, you know, they were absolutely amazing. And, of course, and then hearing Dreamland, Linda Moulton Howell, I think, really inspired me, too, because, you know, she's one of the world's leading experts on like crop circles and cattle mutilations and just, you know, a wealth of knowledge. And she was one of Art's go-to people on Dreamland back in the 90s. She would give like, you know, Art different reports of uh, different things that were going on all over the country. So I would say for me, like doing that and then in 2002, one of my late mentors, her name was Dr. Michael Lee Mayer. She's since passed away. She did a quantitative analysis is of the general Wayne Inn. And I remember going there with a local Philadelphia team that she had at that time. And in the basement area, back then, mind you, ghost hunting equipment wasn't like sophisticated as it was uh, back then that it is now. Sure. You might have had maybe an EMF meter, dowsing rods, a voice recorder, and maybe like, you know, a Geiger counter or something like that, real small stuff, and maybe a flashlight in your senses. Mm -hmm. um, but in the basement area of this old inn, I remember taking three consecutive photos, the old click, click, click with the old digital camera. Yep. And one of those photos actually had green and yellow streaks of light in it. And I went back to Kodak in different places and said, hey, is there anything about the exposure or light that's causing these green and yellow streaks of light? And right in that area that's where people reported seeing a hessian soldier named wilhelm from the revolutionary war in that exact same spot so that uh inn has been like supposed to be featured all over you know the country um you know been on unsolved mysteries and it's called the end of the 17 ghosts in philadelphia uh unfortunately in 2004 it was purchased by you know shabbat the main line so it became a jewish synagogue but i, I hope someday you know the uh, rabbis eventually either sell it or you know i would love to see it like it opened the paranormal investigators all over over the Philadelphia region. I think it'd be a great location for everybody if they ever do uh, reopen. Just because of the history there, it was like a, a stagecoach in that you would stop on the way to Philadelphia. So, and of course, 2004 comes around. I mean, Ghost Hunters comes out. You know, Jason and Great, the plumbers from Rotor Rotor, who are good friends of yours. Um, you know, they, they really inspired me. And then, of course, you had uh, 2007, you had Pet Paranormal State with Ryan Buell, mm -hmm. what they were doing with PRS and Ghost Adventures. So all these shows, I love how they were able to investigate a location, collect all the data, and then, you know, um, use the scientific method, which is like, you know, create a hypothesis, develop the hypothesis and test it and see if you get results using the scientific method. So I was always amazed at how they're able to look at all this data and then, you know, see what kind of evidence they would get, like an EVP or an amazing, like, you know, a digital camera picture or a thermal photo. So I always found that very fascinating. And then 
in 2014, I decided to uh, really branch out and start getting my name out there in the paranormal. So what I did was I was watching this episode called The Haunting of Summerwind, which is this uh, location um, in Wisconsin. I, I saw this episode on television. I was like, you know what? This is a really cool place. I was fascinated with the history. So what I did was uh, I started researching the history, and I found out that Summerwind, um, it was actually created at West Bay Lake Fishing Lodge in 1914. And you can actually stay there for four ninety nine a night in Wisconsin. So, uh, and it was actually founded by a guy named John Frank from Akron, Ohio. He was a local merchant and business person. He moved uh, up in Land O'Lakes, Wisconsin, from Akron in nineteen fourteen. And then two years later, he went ahead and uh, decided to sell the place to future U.S. Secretary of Commerce. It was actually a Secretary of Commerce under President Herbert Hoover named Robert Patterson Lamont. Okay. So Mr. Lamont actually bought the place, and then he started having all kinds of crazy experiences uh in the um you know all over so supposedly the servants would say hey the house is haunted he's like and he would be like grow up there's no such thing as ghosts <laughs> until he had his own supernatural experience at summer when supposedly there was a, a basement door that flew open uh according to the haunting episode revealing the ghostly four man so he fired two two shots pow pow missing the ghost and never returned to the mansion and then in 1948 he passed away and the uh, summer wind supposedly went to a lady named Lillian Kiefer. So Miss Kiefer bought it. And over the next 20 years, she would have people like they would, she would lease it out to them. They would give it back to her, at least it out. So it wasn't until the Henshaw family moved in in the summer of 1969. I, I've known the Hinshaws for a number of years. I've known Raymond Von Bober Jr. and April Douglas, who is Ginger's daughter. So when the Hinshaw family first moved into Summer, when they thought this place would be a great fixer-upper, they had to have it. Um, so when they moved in, Arnold, of course, was uh, Arnold Hinshaw, whose real name was Jim Hill. They changed his name, uh, you know, in the book, The Carver Effect, The Paranormal Experience in 1979, written by Wolfgang Von Bober. Um, so when they changed, when they went, they, they went into the basement, they started flying, they started checking the house it all over the place. And this this was summer wind, mind you, was one of the first houses before it burnt down. They had steam heat, electricity. I mean, it was one of those haunted places in you know the Midwest, and it was a very modern convenience, and it had a servant's house and a playhouse on the property. So um, when the according to the legend of summer wind, they had to nail the Hinshaws had to nail all the windows shut. And then after nailing all the windows shut, they would they, 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 uh, the doors, the windows would fly open. They would hear disembodied voices. And according to the story, uh, Mr. Hinshaw's car called on fire. Um, that was alleged, according to the story of Summer Wind. And one of the craziest stories I've heard of someone that will gore your listener's hair was supposedly in the 1970, uh, April, uh, uh, who is Mr. Hinshaw's uh, stepdaughter, Ginger's daughter, uh, supposedly went up this crawl space where they found this black skeleton. And when they found this black skeleton, the uh, Henshaw supposedly called the police and the skeleton disappeared. And according to the thing, after that, Mr. Henshaw supposedly went mad. He played the organ to all hours of the night oh. after he played the so, so supposedly that was the whole story. Like, suppose you, there's a woods for organ in the house. He would just play until like literally two a.m., three a.m. in the morning, and then after that, he would um, supposedly Ginger tried committing suicide. That's from what I read about the story. And then the family had to stay in one house, one room in the mansion. And then, of course, what happened was. Mr. Hinshaw was committed to a mental institution in Canada, never heard from again. And then, the, of course, Ginger moved out of summer in around 71, and then she gave it back to Miss Kiefer. And then all of a sudden, a guy named Ray Von Bober Sr., you know, who's also a pen name Wolfgang Von Bober, Ray Sr., who was a popcorn vendor from Chicago. He's like, I want to go ahead and make a go of this place again. So he went ahead and tried making a go of the place again. He got it from Miss Kiefer. They, and they owned it. And the, mind you, the Bobers, when they bought it, who was Ginger's father, Ginger pleaded to her father, please do not, uh, buy this place. It's haunted. It, you know, it's very evil. You don't want to mm -hmm. live there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Mr. Von Bo Bober's like, yeah, well, there's no such things as ghosts. And I'm going to make a go of this place and make it work. And much like the Hinshaws, the Bobers had similar problems. They would have, uh, workers and construction workers try coming to work on the mansion like doing like renovations like you know you know painting and priming and you know putting up new lights fixtures up and basically appliances would break down tools would disappear and of course where they would measure blueprints which i actually have the original blueprints of summer wind which are quite hard to find um and according to the story that the uh, blueprints would change shape when the contractors would try measuring out rooms that was supposed to be a legend that was um 
part of with a Bober ownership. And then there was also supposedly a land grant that was buried um, in the foundation of Summerwind where that would allow a guy, an English explorer named Jonathan Carver that would grant to him a northern third uh, for a parcel of land up in northern Wisconsin back in the 1700s. So that's supposedly, you know, that was the ghost haunting the property. And so fortunately, um, the Bobers uh, gave it up to Miss Kiefer in 1979. So when the Miss Kiefer... Uh, passed away in 85, it went to uh, three investors. My name is Harold Tracy and uh, um, his wife, Babs Tracy. They're a couple from across Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Tracy decided, I'm going to go ahead and buy this place as a wedding anniversary present for my wife. And then um, what happened was after, you know, they uh, went ahead and he bought it, he, went, he came back to the deeds of Summer Wind. Um, and then, of course, one night, according to Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, uh, his tongue tied for a second. Oh, yeah. Mr. Miss Tracy, when they were walking up the uh, driveway one night, they supposedly said that Mansion was kind of t inhaling, like taking a life on its own. Unfortunately, in Father's Day of 1988, I was reading uh, an article that uh, the two tall, the, uh, the foundation that the place was supposedly burnt to the ground. The township was supposedly, uh, there was this old neighbor at Summerlin by the name of Jim Lechner, who was friends with my friend Craig Naring. And according to that, like the uh, township was tired of people trespassing on the property, legend tripping, trying to get their own paranormal experiences. So the place was burnt down. So all that remains today is the two tall chimneys, the foundation and the steps. So Jeez. where I come in in 2014 is I decide, okay, I'm going to go on summerwindmansion.com. I buy the original blueprints from Raymond Von Bober Jr. And then I seeked out a connection to the owners of the property. And I uh, came across Craig Naring from the Fox Valley Ghost Hunters. Mm -hmm. Craig actually knew the Tracys. So I sent him a copy of the original blueprints to Summerwind. And then he started doing benefits on the property. And we're now at the point now, you know, we're trying to get, you know, funding to rebuild this home. We've contacted like Jeff Belanger and, you know, from Ghost Adventures. So there's definitely interest in rebuilding building this old home it just would have to come down to funding that's the biggest challenge sure. you know right now with with everything sure. but i think the place has a lot of potential if it's rebuilt right from the original blueprints because you could open it up as a museum or a bed and breakfast and allow paranormal teams to come there i think it would bring a lot of tourism you know um you know plus it's a u.s secretary's commerce house house and there's even rumors that u.s presidents like warren g Hardy and calvin coolidge actually stayed there in the summer <laughs> Well, let me ask you this, okay, uh, Joshua, and let's let's kind of let's kind of play a little what if game here, and that's this. I mean, we're we're fully aware of the fact that other places that have been haunted in the past that have been rebuilt have actually maintained their hauntings, especially when they've been rebuilt with the original foundation or pieces of the of the original foundation. In this case, if the chimneys still have some of their integrity left or you can use parts of that original foundation that would be something uh, a lot of times people will say well the land itself could be haunted so if that's the case do you are you of a mind and explain why that that if the house is rebuilt on that particular land or if part of the foundation is used in that that the same issues will be left with summer wind I think so. I think especially because Craig, uh, you know, the Fox Valley Ghost Hunters has been there many times and they've actually had where they were like, you know, doing like EMF sweeps and EVPs inside the uh, foundation. And sometimes they would have rocks that would come flying out of the foundation, um, mind you, when they would do an investigation. And one of the craziest thing I remember Craig telling me was when they were there uh, one day, they put this one of their investigators in isolation where they had her sit in a chair doing EVP work. And all of a sudden a raccoon actually she flew out of a tree and actually landed on her lap. And, you know, and it was the EDP when you play it back that says, I pushed it, you know? So I think Jeez. the land itself is very haunted. Um, you know, especially even today, there's supposedly Indian burial mounds on the property. So, you know, for me, there has to be, and there's and back in 2017, Craig was there. And you can see supposedly right along the steps, you can, the steps are still part of summer when right where it goes up to the arches where you can get out of the rain, um, right under, right where the steps are, you can see a floating lady. That was pretty wild stuff during Maria Schmidt's world's largest ghost hunt back in 2017. Okay. She started that, of course, with um, Brian J. Cano, who's a very good friend of mine, taught yeah. me a lot. 
And um, so that was pretty wild. So I think the land itself, if the place is rebuilt, I think the activity would actually increase because you're renovating and modifying the structure. The ghost might like the uh, ruins as it is now, but if the place was rebuilt, I think the paranormal activity would really in increase even more because anytime you're working modifying a structure, I think that the uh, I think the ghost would either approve it or disapprove it. They'll, they would definitely let you know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's for sure. Uh, let me go back just a, a couple of steps here but before we go to break. I want to talk about, you know, we, we talk about our fondness for, for something as a child and, and what we remember of it versus when we meet up with it eventually as an adult we or the fulfillment of a childhood dream. You're talking about looking at the General Wayne Inn on, on that program with Robert Stack. And then I want to get your impressions of it as an adult when you first stepped in. What did it feel like to you the first time you you walk in? I want to get your impressions of it because it's it's got to be it's got to everybody has their first impression or their different impression versus the second, third, fourth time that you walk in. What did it feel like the first time to you when you realize that I'm finally here and you look around? It was pretty wild. It was like a spiritual, and I remember like literally walking into that place. It feels like like you can just feel the energy like all around you, like all the different like you can feel like you had eyes watching you from the minute that you walked into that place. Because right when you see, right when you walk in, you can see the bar over on the one side, and then you can see like the stairs that were straight ahead. I mean, the place literally like knocked you off your feet the minute that you got in there, and you know literally like you can see the old portraits of like General Wayne and George Washington hanging in there, and of course. Um, you know, Edgar Allan Poe. So the literally the place like it was completely like floored you. And I was absolutely just blown away at how big it was. And it really made you like, you know, realize that this place, you know, the history here made you feel like you're walking back into uh, 18th century, you know, um, Philadelphia being in that place. Because the most of uh, most of it before was converted to a Jewish synagogue, it really uh, was um, one of the most amazing places in terms of Philadelphia. I mean, you know, and also not, also not to mention, it had a lot of old-fashioned, like, chandeliers, like a lot of the uh, bar area was, all that was original. I mean, there was uh, all kinds of energy, and you could feel like the minute you walk in that place that something is not right. There's you, you can feel like, you know, um, there are people eyes staring at you, and makes you, especially going down to the wine cellar, being down the wine cellar taking those photos, it completely terrified me because I literally felt like literally that there's somebody like standing right on top of me. It was definitely a wild experience that I'll never forget. <laughs> interesting, interesting. I just say, uh, you know, I, I wonder, I, I mean, I, I think of different places that I've seen on television then I, I go into it and it's, it's a completely... It's almost a, yeah, it's surreal. I mean, surreal isn't really a good a good word for it because surreal is almost understated. Um, you walk into it and it's something completely different. You know, you think oh, you're yes. you think you're prepared. It's almost like cheating on a test. You know, you, you go, okay, I know what I know what to look for. But then you walk in and you go, this is nothing like I think it would have been. Exactly. And supposedly, according to the history of the inn, I think there was like a murder there sometime around the 90s. I can't remember, like two owners supposedly got into a big squabble and, you know, one uh, guy killed another one. And then what was even wild about the old inn, um, also supposedly Edgar Allan Poe wrote several stanzas of his uh, poem, The Raven, there while sitting at, you know, eating there in the 1950s. So there's been people seeing spirits there literally for over 160 years, as long as the place has been around. Wow. Get pretty wild. Very wild indeed. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I just, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's hard to prepare for an experience like that where you, you, either you're a child and you look at it and you, you dream about being at a place like that, or even it's, it's just a couple of years between you see it on TV and you go, someday I want to investigate that. And you, you build up expectations for it. Then you're finally there and you go, exactly. I'm here. I did it. Yeah. I'm here. I can't believe I'm here. Yeah. And that was just like going to the Betsy Rawls house. I was like, holy heck, I see this on TV. I see my friends Dave Giuliano do it and other people like, you know, and all of a sudden, boom, we're here. And we did that in April 2021. So that was a surreal moment. Just all of a sudden, holy heck, we're at the Betsy Rawls house. And it just kind of completely floored you. <laughs> well, let's talk about the Betsy Ross house for a moment uh, before huh. we go to break. That's one of the... Uh, one of the locations that you did with your team, um, yes. tell us a little bit about how you come upon that opportunity. Sure. So, Betsy Ross, as you know, like every everywhere in Philadelphia, it was like this. It was a it was a cultural capital of the world, the intellectual capital of the world. I mean, the history 
The Declaration of Independence there was uh, signed in 1776. The Constitution was established in 1787. So Betsy Ross, of course, um, she actually, what's amazing about the history of the Betsy Ross house is that Betsy Ross, of course, was approached by George Washington to uh, sew the nation's first flag. You know, um, it was actually supposedly, you know, Betsy, he's like, hey, I need, uh, you know, this kind of flag with like 13 stars representing the 13 colonies. And, you know, so George went ahead and applied her. And then all of a sudden, boom, she comes back with this, uh, you know, flag. And so when the f- first flag was there, it was shown in 1776. And then, of course, Betsy had a husband that supposedly died. And, you know, she passed away sometime, I think, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. So after she passed away, the place became like a tavern. It became a bar for a while, um, a distillery, just like different, you know, functions over the years. So we uh, had the opportunity. So what we did was in April 2021, we decided uh, we're going to go ahead and try to reach out to Historic Philadelphia. So Historic Philadelphia runs a lot of, like, they, they run the Independence Hall. They run the National Constitution Center. Um, I think they run the U- Franklin Mint and other, you know, uh, buildings all over Philadelphia. So I reached out to them and said, hey, uh, do you guys run the Betsy Ross House? And I talked to their publicist, Heather Kincaid, and she says, yes. Um, you know, we do allow paranormal teams here. So, you know, we had to pay a, you know, a certain fee. It wasn't too bad. And mm-hmm. then we got to get like three hours of investigating the Betsy Rawls house. So we just uh, turned the lights out and then just started setting up uh, our equipment in different parts of the Betsy Rawls house. And this was the, uh, I, I reached out to Mr. Rick Warner and Rick, of course, um, you know, actually, I said, hey, you know, he actually worked in the MUFON world uh, for a number of years. He, uh, you know, worked in the Delaware MUFON. So he, I, I reached out to him. I said, you know what? He's got skills in field surveying. He's certified through MUFON. Um, he's, he knows how to interview people. I'll invite him along and join my me and my team member, Sasha, who was with me at that time. So we decided to book this through Historic Philadelphia. And then we set up our equipment. And what's wild was... Rick's debut investigation with us. He's also the U.S. ambassador to the Italian UFO Federation, FUI, will be a great guest for your program. And on um, the night that we were there, uh, Rick and Sa- our team member Sasha were in the basement area uh, doing EVP work. And of course, they had a Paralyte, which is, you know, one of these Paralyte pluses from NCPD. I love Jeff Eastman's uh, Paralytes because they're, they're like a Paralanner. Mm-hmm. That thing started going off like crazy. And then Rick started, you know, taking his voice records, you know, conducting an EVP session in the basement. And all of a sudden, you can hear these growls that came out of his voice recorder. And mind you, I was three floors up, upstairs in um, Bessie Ross's room. And what was wild was I was doing uh, my own, like, thermal camera session. Of course, you know, we used the FLIR um, thermal imaging cameras. And I love the FLIR thermal imaging cameras because they pick up hot and cold signatures or used by, like, auto mechanics. And I point and zapped. Uh, in the uh, in Betsy Rawls's uh, room, where you know the bedroom that she actually passed away and slept in, and you can see clearly. I put like my thermal camera against the uh, plexiglass because, unfortunately, mind you, um, the room is closed off. It's, it has a big barrier. Where I put my uh, you know camera against it. You can see like an eighteen a woman wearing eighteenth century you know gown and all that, like literally right by her bed. And I was able to capture that thermal image. And I tried to look for anything reflective, or maybe there was like a mannequin you know standing that could have caused that. And it was a Colds his signature, and I was told by Dave Giuliano, if it's not like an orange or a red, and it's got some kind of cold signature, it might be something paranormal. You just have to make sure and look at all your angles, and you know, take it to different people in the field. And I took it to numerous experts, and they all came back with the same thing that you call something um, paranormal in that investigation. So those growls combined with that thermal image was a really uh, amazing capture that we caught that night too. Tim, do do we have that growl? Did you send that to me? I think I did. Yes, it should be under. It should be like under growl. Yep. yep. I think this. Think this. Yep. Uh, let's play it for everybody real quick. Here it is. Let's try to get across one run. If you don't want us to be in this room, please cross. Let's play it one more time. Here it is. Let's try to get across one run. If you don't want us to be in this room, please cross. Should play it one more time. I heard the the rumbling underneath that that yeah. yeah yeah most definitely that was that was pretty wild so it was funny after doing that investigation I went back to historic Philadelphia and I said hey is there any kind of rituals or anything done in the basement area like to get those uh, to get those growls I was trying to figure out like 
the source of them, trying to understand, like, maybe there was something done there or at 100 years in the Betsy Ross house, and I was trying to sit down and try to figure out, okay, like, maybe historic Philadelphia can give you some inf- historical information. Maybe there was some kind of, like, a cult thing, you know, going on over that 100-year history or 200-year history. And they said there was no paranormal activity ever recorded. I'm like, hold on a second. So, of course, we're going to downplay it. Like, oh, there's no such thing as ghost or paranormal. But for what we've been able to capture, we determined that the Betsy Ross house is still active to this day. I mean, with all the history there, I mean, it's one of the most haunted places in Philadelphia, hands down. And for any paranormal enthusiast that listens to your show, I highly, highly recommend taking the Betsy Ross tour. And of course, you can set up a private investigation. It's absolutely an amazing place. Were any of the other EVP you sent me from from Betsy Ross, or was that the only one? That was the only one. That was the only one? Okay, I tell you what, let's take our break right here. When we come back, we'll talk about some of the other locations uh, that... Uh, Phantom Detectives has been to, and we'll also introduce you to the team, uh, the current team. Uh, we've already talked about Rick a little bit, but we'll also talk about uh, Melissa, who's the other member of uh, Phantom Detectives, and we'll talk a little bit about her. We'll talk about the reason why uh, Joshua and Rick hunt with a psychic medium, and it does go back to uh, the past. So we'll talk about that as well. Our guest is Joshua Chairs. He is the, uh, we'll say, the founder and lead investigator. Is that fair, Joshua? Sir. Of uh, Phantom Detectives, LLC. And when we come back, we'll talk about some of those other uh, investigations that they've uh, been on, or some of them. And we'll talk about hunting with a psychic medium. We'll do that when we come back. You're listening to the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Our guest is Joshua Chairs. He is the lead investigator and co-founder of Phantom Detectives, LLC. And we're talking a little bit about paranormal investigating and some of the investigations that the group has been on. And of course, we got to play uh, one of the EVP from the Betsy Ross house in Philadelphia just uh, before the break. Now, before the break, I had teased that there's other members of Phantom Detectives, LLC, and one of the, the members we had talked about is actually a psychic medium. I want to ask you this real quick, uh, Joshua, before we jump into the members of the team. One of them is a psychic medium. Now, I had teased before the break that this has to do with an older method of investigation. Why don't, yeah. you, why don't you tell our audience why you're, you're hunting with a psychic medium when some of the programs you've been talking about, you're actually inspired by the scientific method, which doesn't necessarily hunt with a psychic medium. Why are you hunting with a psychic medium? I like, so funny thing is we actually got three psychic mediums on our team. Of Whoa. course, we have the psychic, we have the psychic lawyer, psychic explorer, Mark Anthony. He's working with us remotely. I'm sure he's been a long time guest of your show. Yep. Fantastic guy. Author of three books, Oxford educated attorney. Um, also, uh, you know, renowned uh, all over the world. We also have Holly Foss, uh, the head of our occult symbol spiritual beliefs department. She's a psychic medium. She's written uh, two books as well. Um, she worked with PRS under Elfie Music. And of course, Melissa, um, actually, here's the funny story about Melissa. So she actually, I got a recommendation from Cindy Kaza from the Holzer Files, you know, at, you know, long time. I'm sure you know her very well. And mm-hmm. Dave and uh, Cindy, I actually discovered that Melissa was one of her students was actually living in the area um, in, uh, you know, June 2, 2021. So I found that, hey, Melissa, we don't have a psychic medium on our team. And the reason I reached out to Melissa, she actually, you know, she's a psychic medium. She studied, uh, you know, advanced mediumship under Cindy uh, as well. She's an expert on shamanic healing, crystal healing, EFT, energy tapping. She also knows past life regressions really well. So I thought she was kind of that missing element because having a psychic medium on the team, when you could use that psychic medium and have them tune into impressions and things that they're picking up on, they can sometimes use their senses and that, you know, that sixth sense of picking up on things that, you know, we investigators 
might not be able to do it. So usually we'll use the equipment, basically, you know, for example, the Obulus, and, you know, set that up and let it run on dictionary mode using the EMF fields, like Bill Chappell's device, and then see if Melissa can match some of the impressions and readings with, you know, the equipment. So I thought having her come into the talent pool would absolutely, like, take us to another level. And, of course, Melissa, having studied under Cindy, I thought that she was kind of the missing piece because she's also got skills with – um. You know, being all, you know, she's a clairaudient. She can hear the dead. She was a clairsentient. She can sense the dead. And I believe she's also a clairvoyant. She can see the dead. So I thought bringing her in was really going to put us over the top. And I remember her debut investigation. She, uh, you know, started, uh, I invited her to come into her first investigation at a place called the Selma Mansion. Mm -hmm. And the course of the Selma Mansion uh, was actually, uh, she's like, I'm Joshua, I'm picking up a connection to Lincoln, Lincoln. And I remember I met you in Gettysburg uh, for mm -hmm. Femenology 2020 there. And um, I was talking to Bill Freeman also that day. And of course, the late Bill Freeman uh, was the uh, manager of the Selma Mansion. He's since passed away in April 2022. But he was a great guy and when i met bill and i said hey would we, we all come out and i when we booked the investigation she's like i'm picturing a connection to lincoln and i go back and check the history of the selma mansion and i find out that uh you know actually the great grandfather mary todd lincoln actually created selma mansion his name was general andrew porter he served under george washington in the american uh revolution so for melissa to pick up on that that was pretty wild and mind you, when the night that we did that investigation, she's like, I'm also picking up on a servant lady, you know, and I went, uh, checked back the history. I found out there was a servant lady named Martha there that uh, supposedly was a servant for the porters back in the late 1800s, uh, early seven, you know, early, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. And I also find out that, you know, we set up the equipment area. We went to the upstairs uh, child's room, you know, one of those uh, doors like flew open by itself and our EMF meter started going off. We started having uh, cat balls starting like lighting up like crazy. And we also had, you know, ghost box picking up spirit words. So that investigation was pretty wild. And Melissa has gotten better and better with every single case that we've done. And we've even invented um, our own uh, version of the Estes method, which is to call the chairs Warner method, which was one of the, it's, it's even an improved version of what they do on the like, kindred spirits. We've made our own version that makes that unique to us. That hmm. we've used, we're, we're using Melissa's our psychic medium, and we have her go tapping into the spirit world. So she's done really great. So the advantages of having a psychic medium is I like that, just like Michelle Bell and Jay did on Paranormal State, we just kind of let Melissa kind of walk through, you know, put a blindfold on and just start picking up, you know, picking up things and see what she gets and see if there's any kind of like history that matches what she's feeling or impressing. Imp and as a historian of the group, I can almost tell you like she's been spot on with every single location, you know. Really? So she's yeah. kind of your canary in the coal mine, huh? Yes, she is. <laughs> Interesting. And she also serves as case manager, too. Like, she does a lot of the bookings for the investigations. Like, she's kind of like the Donald LaCroix and Cindy Cosner of our group. She does both. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. So with that being said, though, it, that still doesn't take away from the the scientific stuff that you're doing, right. obviously. I mean, I, I went on, I did a little, in, little investigating myself on your group and went on your website and, and I'm looking at the list of equipment that you're using. I mean, there's a pretty impressive amount of equipment you're using. I guess with that being said, I'm, without having an, and by the way, in the description of this program, there's a link to your website where people can go and they can see the amount of equipment that you're using. There's a lot of cameras you guys are using. Oh. oh, yeah. Like we use like, uh, you know, standard thermal imaging cameras that pick up hot and cold signatures. We actually use the UT, uh, the HDI 03. We started out using FLIRs, but we found out the HDI had a bigger screen. So we're using thermal cameras. We're using, um, you know, of course, digital voice recorders. We're using, we have like three or four different ghost boxes. Like, you know, the PSB 7 Pro. I love Gary Galka. Got, you know, he's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the S box from Ghost Stop, um, as well as, you know, the PSB 11. We have that one. And we also use an extensive array of, you know, we have lighted dowsing rods that we got from NCPD from Jeff Eastman, amazing inventor. I like having the lighted dowsing rods because you can change the colors and it's great for filming when we're in the dark working. And also, we are also the millimeter and, you know, the tri-field EMF meters. So there's a lot of extensive array of equipment. Of course, we also use, um, you know, para lights, para rims, you know, music boxes. I mean, the whole enchilada. I mean, anything that's everything. If it's a piece of equipment, we'll utilize it. And we use REM pods and I look, we have a couple of Ghostbusters cars, REM pods, which I think are really cool. We use a four camera DVR system. And the advantage of having a security system doing tech is that, say, for example, you're not in a room and all of a sudden, 
like you hear like a beep beep or you hear the uh, with sensor go off sometimes those dvr cameras if, if we're not there and we can't jump in that room right away having a, a nvr system is huge because they can they can pick up things they can pick up orbs they can pick up uh possible spirit voices they can also pick up like mist and shadows and stuff like that so it's got shadow detection and of course we use shadow trackers just like shane Pittman does and stuff like that so having a good equipment i think is very essential it's kind of like it adds to the flavor of the, the ice cream it adds a little a lot more to you know the, uh, the nuts and bolts with the psychic beings picking up so we try to cover all of it and all of our equipment like is really great because sometimes spirits don't act on command they're going to pick and choose the equipments that they like to uh, use with that being said, um, are you finding that a lot of the times the the physical is corroborating the psychic, the psychic is corroborating the physical, or do you ever find that there's times where they're they're contradicting each other? I'm going to say uh, there's times when they're contradicting each other because sometimes, for example, Melissa might pick up on a bunch of stuff, then all of a sudden, a lot of times the physical, or sometimes we might get like touched, or we might like, you know, sometimes get, we've never been shoved. Like we always say, like, please and thank you. And we've noticed that when you say thank you for allowing us to come in your homes, thank you for allowing us to come in your business, when you're kind and respectful, you're going to get good response. And I never believe in like provoking, like, you know, and I always try to say, you know, being, you know, treat the spirits like it's their home. And when you do that, you're going to get a lot of good results. And that's why we always get so much evidence every time because we're humble or down earth, but we treat the spirits like this is their home and their place. And when you do that, you're going to get a lot of results. So I've noticed like almost every time, like, you know, being like respectful and, you know, showing the spirits that you care for them and you, you know, we want to try to understand their stories. Because every spirit's got a story and there's always a, every location's got a history to it. And that's what it really draws me in is like the history and the paranormal in every place. And that's what's so cool about it because you can learn so much. And I've noticed that a lot of times, like, you know, those things can usually cross sect uh, very seldomly like sometimes you'll get like the physical part and sometimes you get the psychic medium part yeah absolutely let's talk about a couple of the uh the different locations and we'll talk about some of the evp that you brought us tonight um let's talk about white chimneys and, and how your group came across this location sure so white chimneys is a really cool place it's kind of similar to the general wayne Inn. it was a it was a, a coaching in you know dates back it used to be called the Slaymaker and Lock Company back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And it's recorded, reported that Lafayette visited there, uh, Ben Franklin as well. So it was another place where people that could go on a, like it's, it's like, it's now a wedding venue, but it's a place where people could stop and go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where they could, you know, be able to go to and from. It's just, it's just like the General Wayne was the place in Philadelphia. This was the place that people could go out to Lancaster or York County. So it's got an amazing history. And of course, it was also connected to the Underground Railroad as well and some of the so we went ahead and my sister uh Kristen is actually good friends with the owner of um you know white chimneys which is uh jessica meyer so jessica and uh, i got uh, her in touch with rick and rick did an interview with her rick handles all of our client interviews mm -hmm. so we booked an investigation around there about a week before christmas of 2021 and we set up equipment all over uh doing like you know laser grid lights and emf meters and voice recorders and ghost boxes all over the place and what was wild was of course we all split up so rick went ahead and started going upstairs um doing uh his own like um ghost box so he started scanning the s box from ghost stop and i love the advantage of the S box, which is great compared to the other ghost boxes, it has internal storage. You can pop in your own micro SD card and back up your sessions and replay them later. So Rick went up to the attic area of White Chimneys and you can hear different EVPs that were captured from the ghost box just by scanning the AM and FM dial. And mind you, spirit boxes also use like white noise. So I love having the S box because you can really get some good results with it. And he got numerous uh, EVPs captured from the S box just by scanning the AM and FM dial really interesting yes um any of the evp that you you had given us that are from white chimneys yeah i think um yes i think there's one that's and my family members stay out that was one and i think there was also one that uh there's quite a few too um i think that was one and my family members stay out and there's also one that says penny with <laughs> okay penny with so this is the one i believe that you're talking about right here so here's the first evp here Let's go ahead and play it for you now. All right, let's play it one more time. Here we go. I 
hear the family members part. Yeah, family members, and my family members stay out. I think that's what. It, yeah, that's what it was. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Let's play it one more time here. Wow, that is really clear. Yeah, definitely. And it was wild was I did some research and I found out that some slaves actually, you know, since it was connected to the Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. there was a lot of slaves that came in and out of White Chimneys. I mean, of course, it was a plantation, I believe, back in this 1800s. So it makes sense. There's a lot of those spirits that are still lingering around there. <laughs> That's almost a British accent on that voice. Yeah. I think it was also a lot of like uh, British officers and stuff like that that were in and out of the revolution were also visiting, you know, around that area around that time, too. So it makes a lot of sense that there could be, uh, you know, possible, you know, um, revolutionary war spirits also there as well. <laughs> and then you said the uh, the other one is a penny with run, right? Yeah. OK, here we go. Yes, sir. All right, let's play it another time. Here it is. All right, one more time. See, I hate calling out the name of it because we've we've influenced people, but I hear it once I say the name. I but without um, without uh, without calling out the name, it's I know I I don't know. I mean, calling out the name, I hear it, but but if I didn't call out the name ahead of time. I don't know that I'd hear the same phrase. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times, uh, EVPs are always subject to interpretation. Right. Sometimes one person might say it's one thing, then all of a sudden someone might interpret it differently. So this is uh, a lot of times in our field, there's going to be like different perspectives and different points of view of what's being said in terms of the uh, well, the voices. <laughs> you you tell me, Joshua, what's the story? Why do you think it says penny width? Why, what is the history behind it that penny width so, would be the, the story or the story behind the EVP? So I think the story behind that is there might've been somebody that visited there, like a family that, you know, was, a, you know, was a friend of the slave maker and lock company. I was supposedly was reading that there was, uh, you know, a family that visited that were friends of the, uh, you know, slave maker company back in the early 1800s, late 1700s. So my assumption is it was probably, you know, maybe one of the spirits like trying to say, Hey, uh, you know, you know, kind of talk about like, maybe just mention a phrase that dealt with the history of the white chimney. So it could have been, someone like a family there that stayed there or a guest or something along those lines according to what my research is and i'm going to go back and ask um jessica meyer the owner of white chitneys uh about that and maybe she can get shed more light on like who you know who like what member of the penny penny or family any story about their back history that would be really fascinating to find out okay all right uh tell us a little bit about lightship overfalls in this uh, uh -huh. particular area and in, in in property and and yeah. how you guys got in there Sure. So Lightship Overfalls, in fact, we were talking about this on Talk is Jericho. I'm sure you know Chris very well. Great guy. Yep. Um, so the Lightship Overfalls is a really cool place. It's in Lewis, Delaware, which is in the southern Delaware area of uh, Delaware. It's kind of like Delaware, Maryland area. So it's down the beach area. And what's really cool is this Lightship was actually used by the U.S. Coast Guard from 1938 to 1972. So it was basically a lighthouse on a ship. So if you need to be able to move your, your lightship, if you, if you want to have a floating lighthouse where you can kind of guide ships in and out of the harbor, this was actually um, used by the Co Coast Guard in Massachusetts for a number of years. So the name Overfalls came from a lot of the uh, shipwrecks and stuff that are in the uh, Lewis, Delaware uh, area. And what's really cool in the town of Lewis, there's also a house uh, called Cannonball House, which is uh, supposedly got a, a cannon stuck inside a very haunted place where a late, uh, supposedly a lady died there in the 1900s in the Cannonball House. So the Overfalls, uh, when it was decommissioned in 72, it was brought to Lewis, Delaware, and, you know, the Overfalls Foundation runs it. So there was a previous team there um, in 2012, 2013 in uh, Delaware that was very well known with their founder, uh, Rick 
Rick Coward. So we went there and we said, we want to go ahead and kind of build upon what they did. Uh, their group was called Del Mar Restore Cons. So I went ahead and, you know, reached out to the foundation. And I said, I want to bring Phantom Detectives here, see what we can capture. So we went ahead and set up uh, all our equipment in different parts of the light ship. And we went ahead and uh, decided, OK, we're going to go ahead and do that. So mind you, um, so we started setting up equipment all over the light ship. We had a lot of things that happened that night. In, in fact, it actually allowed us to make the local news numerous times in December 2022. So the first thing that happened was Rick actually uh, brought his, he has an Annabelle REM pod, you know, really cool. I love the Annabelle doll. Mm -hmm. And the REM pod, there's like this utility area of the ship, like the utility areas between like the, the crews, like on what the left side of the ship was like the, the crew quarters and on the right side of the ship would have been like the administration, like the first mates and the captain, stuff like that for the Coast Guard. So mind you, in the utility area, which is like right between the uh, the two two sections, they started like the REM pods are going off like crazy, like beep, 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 like that. And then Rick, of course, is an expert on the light of dowsing rods. He started asking questions and he got strong answers. Is this the captain of the ship? We got to cross the rods for us to pull apart. And we got numerous crossings where there was a captain on the ship. And then what was wild was we also set up the Paralyte, you know, our Paralyte Plus uh, from NCPD. And that started spiking, especially in the captain's quarters, like really huge. And I think we had that on our uh, TikTok uh, page, Fan Detectives LLC. So that was spiking like crazy. And then we started wrapping up the night. We call our, our EVP session Phantom Time. We let the Phantoms come out and talk to us on our voice recorders. So when we did that, uh, we started sitting in, in the uh, captain's cabin, started asking questions, said, hey, you know, is there anybody here with us? And you can hear this lady. Mind you, it was rainy that night, too, the perfect conduit for paranormal activity. Mm -hmm. And mind you, getting into this light ship, you can't, like, access the lower section. You actually have to crawl down a ladder. So we had to get our equipment up this big ramp like this, and then we had to basically, you know, go down to the ladder portion. And uh, when we got our equipment down there, we started doing the EVP session. You can hear this female voice say hello help me and mind you there was nobody in the area like everyone like it, like it was rainy that night it was dark there was nobody near us and the uh, person that runs the overfalls uh, mr safina he wasn't there as well so mind you to pick up this woman's voice on this voice recorder i i have no reasonable explanation why it happened and then what happened was weeks later we got contacted by uh the Cape Gazette, so they wanted to do an article about us, and then we did that, and then um, WRDE Coast AM picked up on the story of our investigation there and, you know, did a story about it as well. So that EVP, I have no reasonable explanation why it happened, but there's only about five or six light shifts left in the United States. So if you ever go or have any listeners in Delaware that check out the Overfalls, it's an absolutely amazing location. It's absolutely beautiful in Southern Delaware. And the Overfalls is still there. It's available for tourists for only $5 a piece. So it's a great wow. historical place. And we determined that there's um, you know, a lot of paranormal activity at the Overfalls even today. And even the owner, uh, the person or the president of the foundation didn't believe in the paranormal. But after we did the investigation there and he heard the EVP that we captured and all the other things, he actually became a believer. <laughs> well, we have that EVP here. Let's, uh, let's play that right now. All right, let's play it one more time. I definitely hear it in there. One more time here. All right. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Yes, definitely. I think that was uh, one of our the coolest places. And I, I, I still put the light ship as like one of my, it's very dear to my heart. I absolutely love it. And I'm always going to remember investigating there. It's a really cool place. And uh, it's funny how at first, like it's people say it wasn't haunted, but then we determined that, you know, based on that the previous team was there, we approved their investigation by like 150%. We took it like to the next step. So there's definitely paranormal activity on that light ship. So because, especially because all the ships that went down in that, in that area, I mean, all those spirits could be still on that light shift trying to want to connect and communicate with the living. So it's a great location and uh, absolutely love it. And the, uh, ships are always have a mystique to uh, being haunted and you know creepy. And there's always kind of always stories of like, you know, think about the, you know, the Queen Mary out in California. And, yeah. and of course, uh, the USS Constellation when Dave was uh, there and a the hammock was swinging back and forth. And when, when, when he was doing that on the Holzer files. So ships always have an amazing story to tell. Yeah, most definitely.
Let's talk uh, lastly about the Bucksville House. Uh, tell us a little bit about that particular investigation and what made that one so special. Sure. So the Bucksville House is a really, really amazing location. It was created by uh, Nicholas Buck around 1805. It's got a lot of history. A lot of the Buck family lived there for generations and generations. And it was actually featured, I think, around 2004 as one of America's most haunted inns. Um, in It's in Kintersville, Pennsylvania, which is basically right outside Allentown. And what's amazing about the Bucksville House, there's actually a chest in there that's very haunted. It's supposedly... Uh, Chip Coffee, of course, longtime guest of your show, was there, I think, around 2010, 2011 with uh, Barb Schwazley. Barb, of course, Barb and Joe owned the Bucksville house. And Chip actually went there and stood next to that chest and felt a lot of energy off the thing. And uh, so we actually reached out to Barb and said, hey, would fan detectives be able to come to an investigation there? And, of course, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, it was actually an active bed and breakfast. Barb and Joe used to run it, but then they retired. So we reached out to them and they allowed us to book it. And uh, we had a lot of crazy experiences uh, doing the investigation that night. I mean, uh, the first thing that happened was we started picking up thermal camera images, like right in our equipment staging area, like which is the right outside where the, uh, the right where the uh, deck is on the, on the porch. We started uh, picking up, like, you know, we started, we, we started with, like, a, a, a heat print on the hand. But mind you, this was a heat signature. None of us had touched any of our equipment at all. Mm-hmm. You know, to that hand, that you know, that hand signature came on uh, our equipment. And then, of course, Melissa, mind you, she had no knowledge of the Bucksville house. She started using spirit dice. She likes to use, you know, sometimes spell out words with her, you know, kind of roll out her dice and see if she picks up, you know. She actually picked, spelled the word Nicholas and had no idea that the founder of the Bucksville house name was Nicholas. So she was able to pick up on that. And then, of course, we got the word, uh, you know, Buck and also Nick on the obvious, which is kind of interesting, you know, using Bill Chappell's dictionary, or just that those words came up on the obvious. And then when Rick uh, was, you know, it was funny things, we're just kind of goofing off. So right, we're getting ready to start our dowsing rod session when Rick was going uh, uh, crossing the rods. You can see literally um, right by the 1795 room. I think I have this and I can send you this clip. Rick is kind of goofing off. And then Todd Sylvia, our buddy Todd Sylvia from Relatively Paranormal, great guy. He actually has a lot of great equipment events, and he actually uh, was able to free frame this where you can see the spearhead floating right around the 1795 room. And you can see it like it's in slow motion, everything. I'll text that over to you and I'll email it to you so you can see the clip. It was pretty wild because Rick was just kind of goofing off, like, you know, kind of showcasing at the Bob Barker chat, you know, the chip coffee chest. <laughs> we had that happen. And we also picked up uh, an EVP that said Melissa, which was pretty wild. <laughs> And we have that. Actually, we have that uh, here too, as well. So let's play. Uh, oh. Let's play that EVP. Uh, that Melissa EVP. Oh, here we go. One more time. Yeah, that's kind of creepy. Here we go. One more time. Okay, if I heard that in my ear, I'd be a little uh, weirded out. Absolutely, and that one was pretty wild. And there's also another one. I think that was like I'd be gone. You can hear like another spirit. Um, so what was wild was Barb actually has collected a lot of uh, things over the years from like, different paranormal teams that have been to the Bucksville house. Uh, she's got a scrapbook of like, um, you know, people like light, especially up in the attic area. Um, and mind you, we started doing um, our chairs Warner methods. So what we do it was we, we blindfold our psychic medium, Melissa, and then we add a, a voice recorder. We add an EMF meter to the chairs Warner method. And we started scanning the AM FM dials up in the attic area. And mind you, the ghost box started malfunctioning like crazy like we never had that happen and we tried to you know it, the batteries died out and a lot of times that happens so i think it's like sometimes the spirits are just don't want to be heard on the ghost box so mm-hmm. they'll try to drain the batteries and uh the, mind you also happened that night we also got another evp i said i'd be gone i'd be gone that was pretty wild so the buffalo house is definitely very active and with that chest in there i mean that thing is like a conduit of paranormal activity and supposedly according to uh the uh, person that brought it into barb's house to uh, barb's uh a uh, house basically at the Bucksville house supposedly it was like some kind of traveling merchants back in like the 1800s yeah let's play that EVP right now here it is oh weird okay well, one more time and a third time wow that's pretty clear wow 
it's it's pretty wild like just going through and the funny thing is these evps if they're not I, we didn't pull those on the voice records i pulled those from the dvr so what i did was i just went back played it and then just isolated in audacity try to amplify it as best as i could and you know uh, slow it down to half speed and a lot of times you just play it back and that's what you capture it's just pretty amazing i love about evp learning under uh, ron Millon, who is like pretty much was on paranormal state was one of the country's leading evp experts he trained me how to slow it down and of course learning under brian j cano um you know just all you have to do is just go back to use your voice recorder and play back and listen and sometimes you find things that you don't that the human ear can't pick up <laughs> yeah ron was also with taps for quite some time too or he was working with taps for a while as well uh, we had him on the, we had him on the show a long long time ago we're talking like 2007 wow that was like in the early days of, of uh darkness radio yeah yeah a long time ago long time ago uh, one of the things I noticed uh, as we begin to wrap up today here, Joshua, is that uh, you guys offer uh, paranormal investigator training. Yes, we do. And uh, what's so cool is uh, if you go, so what we did was last year, Rick and I uh, made some videos and uh, we actually offer our, you know, subscribers, uh, you know, a Patreon account. So Shane's like, hey, why don't you guys start, Shane Piven for the good friend of our teams, you know, from the Holzer file said, hey, why don't you guys set up a Patreon and offer paranormal investigator training? So we got the gold, silver and bronze packages. We got like a master class. And what we do is we teach our we teach our, our subscribers how to set up the equipment, how to do readings, how to store your equipment, how to also, uh, you know, uh, conduct, uh, you know, basically how to conduct, a, how to use a ghost box. I mean, there's all kinds of equipment like that we use. So all those videos are available in these different tiers. So all you got to do is just go to patreon.com. And you and type in Phantom Detectives. That's patreon.com slash Phantom Detectives. And all the information is laid out there. We have our best client interviews, our best thermal images in there. And what's really cool was I went ahead and I have the original Leo Ashcraft Dark Matter News news files. I sent those over to Rick. So since we own the brand now and we purchased it, we went ahead and integrated Dark Matter, the Dark Matter News uh, files that Leo recorded for Art Bell uh, from July 20th up to October first 2015 those are all included uh with the patreon thing so it's a really great thing to learn from a professional team that cares and loves it you know and loves to help helping people and making a difference so those classes are available for everybody and they're and for all of it for all skill levels even for someone that's just starting out in the field to someone that's experienced and might want to learn you know different techniques and this is what it's all about para unity sharing information understanding it and helping each other grow and learn so this is why i love doing a patreon so we can help people learn how to investigate absolutely absolutely there you go there there's uh there's lots of stuff out there for you guys to not only learn learn from but learn of from uh phantom detectives uh we have the link in the description of this program and in the future we'll bring on the entire team because we like to get to know the uh the team as well a lot from rick and melissa and and hopefully the good reverend as well Absolutely. That would be wonderful. And of course, you know, Holly, uh, the expert on cult symbols, working at Pierce and Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer. I mean, Mark's been on the show many times and he might be coming with us in the future. And I thought Mark would be a fantastic mentor to Melissa because especially with her, she's really developing her skills and she's really growing and growing. And I think she's got so much potential to become one of the best mediums in her field one day. She has that kind of talent to really get better. So it's going to be a lot of fun when we come back with the whole team. We'll be able to share with you even more experiences and the beautiful thing about having Rick is that our team covers all the aspects of the paranormal. We got paranormal news, we got psychic mediums, we've got UFOs covered now, we've got historical information, which is me, we got occult symbols, spiritual beliefs with Holly. So we got a Swiss Army Day for the paranormal all in one group. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, Joshua, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate it. I look forward to hearing from you hopefully later this year. Sounds good. Thank you. Want to thank Joshua Chairs for being on the program today. Of course, Phantom Detectives LLC is the name of the group. We have a link in the description of this program to the website so you can check out everything that the group's been up to and even sign up for investigator training through Phantom Detectives LLC. Again, thanks to uh, Joshua Chairs for being on. We'll bring the entire group on in the future, probably towards the end of summer, beginning of fall, somewhere in there, and you can meet the entire group and we can talk a little bit more about what they've been up to and you can meet them as well. Uh, heading into the weekend, folks, we're expecting snow here in the Twin Cities. We've had exactly 14 and a half inches throughout the entire winter. We thought we got away from it and now we're expecting snow. So, 
uh, if you're in the Twin Cities area or in St. Cloud and you want to just huddle up around a, uh, I don't know, a roaring snowbank and listen to me, I'll be on KNSI this weekend on Saturday uh, from 7 to 9 a.m. You can listen to me on KNSIRadio.com and uh, enjoy looking at fluffy white stuff, which is unusual for us this winter. We don't know what that looks like. All of a sudden, we've become the Florida of the North up here in Minnesota. So KNSIRadio.com from 7 to 9 this Saturday morning. A couple of notes for you before we leave you today. You know, this past week, I had put it on social media that I had a little bit of a small miracle, and I kind of want to brag about it a little bit. And not necessarily brag, I kind of want to celebrate. I want to celebrate with you guys. I, You know, I, I've talked a little bit about health issues over the last few years, and I don't like to talk about that sort of stuff because I kind of look at it as a negative. But when I have little wins, I like to celebrate it with you guys because, you know, they're, they're high points for me. They're high moments that I like to share with friends, and I consider you guys friends. So uh, I went into the eye surgeon expecting another shot in the eye, you know, the two needles and we're done type deal. Well, I went in and I did the regular prep. You know, they put in the, the numbing agent. They put in the dilation for the eyes. They were about to do the sterilization, and... They did the scans on the eyes to see how everything looked with the retina in the retinal vein. And the nurses took a look at it and they said, well, wait a minute, we're going to call in the doctor and have the doctor take a look at it. And I thought that was unusual. And the doctor takes a look at it and the nurse says, I don't think we're going to have to do a shot today. And we'll have the doctor confer. The doctor takes a look at it and says, you know what? I don't think we're going to have to do a, a shot today. And I went, really? And he goes, yeah. In fact, you're, you're developing what, uh, what we like to call trunk cells. And these are cells that grow in the area when they've been giving you this Avastin in your eye. They're cells that grow after the swelling has gone down in the eye and that's the first sign of being in remission or healing when you've had this this uh trauma to the eye which is the, the first sign that you're better and you don't have to go in for these these shots and i went okay we're on our way right and not only that but i've had really good healing with the foot here now i'm i'm knocking on wood but i've had some really good healing lately so i wanted to share that with you guys and and that I'm, I'm going into the weekend with some really positive stuff. And, and with that, you know, you, you hear this sometimes with sports players. And you, I know a lot of you roll your, roll your eyes when you hear it. They give all glory to God and, and they, they throw their, their hands skyward. But I got to do that too, you know. It, I've done a lot of praying, a lot of cheating and praying. Sometimes you do that, you know. And sometimes a lot of people do it when their backs are against the wall. But I've been doing it a lot over the last few years. And sometimes you, you, you know, you, you hope for that small miracle and hope that things will turn around. And, you know, a lot of times we only pray when we're desperate. But I've been praying a lot down the line just in hopes that I would turn around. And it worked. And I like to hope and pray that you guys were praying for me as well. And I know a lot of you have been. And I just like to tell you that those prayers worked. And there is such a thing as small miracles. And actually, these are pretty big miracles. That's a pretty big change for your eye to turn around from going to just having 15% of your vision to only having a 10 to 15% blockage in your vision in your left eye. I, I have 85 to 90% of my vision now in my left eye. So that's pretty good, I think. I call that a huge win. And I'm up and walking around now on my foot, on my Charco foot. All that I'm using now is a brace and a tennis shoe. I'm out of a cast. I've been out of a cast for months. So there you go. I mean, that's a, that's a huge improvement. And now it's just uh, working on chronic pain issues and working on my back and neck, which that's a long-term project. But you know what? We're getting there day by day, little by little, and we're working on stuff. And that's, that's what's important. So there you go. Positive movement forward. And sometimes 
You just need a little help from your friends. And sometimes you just need a little help from your Lord. So there you go. Or whatever it is you believe in. I'm not pushing anything on you guys this this weekend. You can believe in a rock on the ground. You can believe in whatever God you want to believe in. You can believe in whatever it is you believe in. Just so long as you keep yourself moving forward positively. That's all. Keep it moving positively. Move forward step by step, day by day. This didn't happen overnight, and it won't happen overnight. You know who else I have to thank, too? Diamond Dallas Page. I met him a couple years ago, more than a few years ago, and he put a bee in my bonnet to move forward positively, and it really made an impact on me. So I got to thank Dallas, too. Dallas has really, really made an impact. If you want somebody who will help you find positivity, if you're not a naturally positive person, Diamond Dallas Page will do that for you. If you've never tried DDPY, DDP Yoga, give it a shot. Take a look at ddpyoga.com or ddpy.com. It'll change your life. One other thing I want to mention to you before we... uh, close the book on this week and this weekend uh i want to thank our sponsors and our sponsor this week was surfshark surfshark vpn don't get caught red-handed by hackers don't get caught with your life changing in a negative way we've been talking about the positive don't get caught in a negative way don't get caught by hackers don't get your bank account emptied Don't lose something in a negative way. Protect yourself. Be in front of stuff these days. The internet's a dangerous place. It used to be a fun place. used to be able to go on the internet. used to be able to go have fun on the internet. Not anymore. Your information is at risk. Every time you jump on the internet, whether it's on your phone, whether it's on your tablet, whether it's on your computer, your PC, or your laptop, you're always at risk on the internet. Well, Surfshark is here to help you with that, and they're helping me with it as well. Folks, as I told you, I got got. Long story short, I got got, and I got got for a huge sum of money. Although my bank helped me get it back, Don't take that risk. There's a lot of banks that aren't doing that now. A VPN, virtual private network, will help keep you safe by covering up your IP address. It will also help you do other things that are actually kind of fun, like being able to disguise your IP address so you can get a whole new set of programs on Netflix, a whole new playlist so you can watch something different on Netflix. It helps you do other things as well. Plus, Surfshark has all kinds of neat things to help protect you, not just the VPN, but they've got malware protection. They've got antivirus as well. They've got lots of things, a whole suite of things, as a matter of fact, to help protect you. Trust me on this, folks. Surfshark is where it's at. It's got the latest technology to keep you safe. Check it out. Don't take my word for it. Check it out for yourself. Not only that, but get a discount as well. Go to surfshark.deals slash darkness. And when you're there, use the code darkness for an extra three months free. Secure your privacy with Surfshark. Enter the code darkness for an extra three months free at surfshark.deals slash darkness. Try it this weekend while you're inside dodging the snow if you're in the middle of the country or while you're freezing down south. It is going to be a chilly weekend this weekend. While you're inside, check out Surfshark. If you're confused as to where to go, check out darknessradioshow.com. We'll have Surfshark on the website at the bottom of the page. You'll see the logo for Surfshark. Click on the logo, be able to check them out there. So that'll do it for this week. want to thank our guests for this week, Doug Carey and Joshua Chairs. And I want to thank you guys as well for being great listeners, for supporting the program, supporting our sponsors, and checking them out as well. We got another huge week of shows next week, folks. Tune in, find out True Crime Tuesday and the best in paranormal programming. For Mally Fox, for Jessica Freeberg, for Beer City Bruiser, I'm Tim Dennis. We'll see you next week for Darkness Radio.